today we have for our meditations one of the most chilling stories in the Bible. The vivid account on how the king David committed adultery was Bathsheba, the wife of one of his most faithful elite soldiers, Uriah, and how David murdered Uriah. Isn't this Bible a strange book? This is how it openly depicts one of the heroes of faith, one of God's favorite saints, one of the main characters in the Old Testament history. So how do you feel when you hear this story? For David is one of, one of us, one of God's beloved. And that's what his name actually means, beloved. So why do we have this shameful page in, in the life of otherwise faithful and, and righteous, courageous and devout King David, recorded with all the embarrassing and even shocking details? What's the purpose of this? Through this lively account, the Holy Spirit brings to us, not only to our minds, but to our very hearts, two of the most important teachings of the Bible. He teaches us about sin and about God's unbelievable grace, about our sin and about God's unbelievable grace. And this is what I invite you to reflect on today as we meditate on this event. Now let us do a little test. Let us examine ourselves. Let us look into our hearts and souls and let us, let us tell ourselves honestly, how do we measure up against the King David? How do we measure up against him? When you hear this story, what do you think? Are we better than him? Most likely you have never done anything like that. We may be even thinking that we would never, would never ever do anything like that. For what he did, it was, it was shocking. So what do you think? So hold on to your thoughts, hold on, and let us reflect on, on what we know about King David. And the book of Samuel reveals a great deal about this man. He came from an ordinary family as the youngest son bravely shepherding his family's flock. But then, it was God himself who chose him to be a king of Israel. And the reason why God chose David was quite remarkable. Because he knew David's heart. He knew David's heart. He knew what was hidden from the human eye. He knew the very inner being of David. And he saw that David was a man after God's own heart. And as we read the accounts of David's life, it's, it's difficult not to begin to love the man. If not love, then at least to like, to, to find him really attractive. He was courageous, athletic, audacious, totally devout to his God, incredibly faithful to his king adventurous and skillful leader in battle, caring for his soldiers, passionate in his friendships, just and fair and humble and generous and gracious as king. How can you not like the guy? And especially when we read how much injustices he had to suffer, how unfairly he, unfairly he was treated, how often he was in danger, but in every situation, he trustingly looked upon his God and fully relied on him, patiently. Not my will, but your will. And finally, God made David the king over the nation of Israel. So much was given to him. He was blessed. He was so blessed. And then, then we get this account. And when we read this account of what happened, we, we can almost feel our hearts sinking. 
What are you doing, David? And this is where we can see the power of sin on display. And before we rush to, to express our condemnation on David, let's just try for a moment to imagine that you are in that position, just for a moment, with all that power to do whatever you want, to get whatever you want. There are loyal people around you and they will fulfill your every request and they will remain loyal and they will remain silent about what has happened. And you can do almost, almost whatever you want and no one will object. No one will hinder your plans. No one will accuse you of anything. And you will have your good name in public. How would you use such a situation? Everything is permitted and almost no consequences. King David was walking on the roof of his palace when he saw this, this beautiful woman, naked, bathing. He saw her and his passions were kindled. Who is she? Go and find out. Isn't this Bathsheba, wife of your faithful warrior Uriah? Sure she is, yes, yes, yes. But, but Uriah is far away, fighting for his king. He is not here to protect his wife. She is alone. Bring her to me. I want this woman. So they brought Bathsheba to David then, and the man after God's own heart slept with her. And she conceived and sent a message to David. I'm pregnant. Ouch. So what now? How to cover what had been done? How to hide this shameful crime? David sent after Uriah under the disguise of wanting to know how things are on the battlefield. And the plan is simple. Let us bring Uriah home. He will use his opportunity to sleep with his wife and David is off the hook. Smart plan. Uriah arrives. He brings the report but then he also brings a nasty surprise to David. He doesn't go to his wife. He doesn't use the favorable circumstances. He is too noble. He is too faithful to his king and to his superiors and, and to his fellow soldiers. He says, my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live, and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. And what a blow to David. Uriah is not just ruining his plan. He, he demonstrates such complete and undivided loyalty to his king, who in his absence just slept with his wife. What an accusation to David. Uriah's righteousness contrasts with David's wickedness. And the King David gives another try. Okay, let us make Uriah drunk. Let's allow alcohol to guide his behavior. And that should solve the issue. Get drunk, sleep with your wife, off you go, and no one will ever find about the dirt in David's resume. But Uriah, <laughs> he is just unbearable. Even drunk, his virtues and loyalty doesn't falter. What can you do with such a faithful servant? The lawlessness of David needs to be covered by all means, whatever the cost even if someone has to die. In the morning, David wrote a letter to, to his general Joab and asked Uriah to deliver his own death sentence. The letter said, 
set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him, that he may be struck down and die. And Joab did as David requested, and, and Uriah the husband of Bathsheba was killed in the battle. And David took Bathsheba as his wife, and, and she bore him a son, and it may appear that David has gotten away. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And the Lord sent prophet Nathan to David. He came to him with this message. There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children, and it used to eat his morsel and drink from his cup and, and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or her to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But instead he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then King David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, that man who had done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did the thing, and because he had no pity. And prophet Nathan said to David, You are that man. You are that man. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? And this is what this account tells us. You are the man. You are that woman. We have despised the word of the Lord. We have done what is evil in His sight. And there are many sins we have done that others do not know. But the Lord knows. And they have displeased the Lord. And the same sin that dwelt in the heart of King David dwells in our hearts. We just don't have that much power. We don't have those opportunities. But if the prophet Nathan would come today, he would say to us, you, you are that person. We are like, we are the ones who have looked at others with lust, with lustful intent. We are the adulterers just like David. We are the ones who have been angry with and have insulted our loved ones. We are murderers just like David. And we have lied, and we have schemed, and we have deceived, trying to cover up what we are ashamed of, so that no one would know, so that we would look like good and moral people. It is us. It is me. It is you. For our God knows our hearts. And we can fool others. And we can even fool ourselves. But we cannot fool our God. What we can and what we should do is exactly what David did. Struck to the heart. By words of Nathan, in heartfelt repentance, David cried out, I have sinned against the Lord. Listen to this sound. Do you recognize it? Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. It's Psalm 51. 
we use it in our liturgy. David wrote this psalm after Prophet Nathan had spoken to him. And we all now join David in, in praying this psalm. But as soon as David's heart was struck, recognizing what he had done, Nathan spoke again the message that mattered the most. He said, David, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. The Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. You are forgiven. And this is the second lesson that we learn from this event. God's incredible grace, undeserved grace, incomprehensible grace. You see, David did not get what he deserved. We do not get what we deserve. Our God is not fair with us. We get His grace and forgiveness. But someone gets what we deserve, what every sin deserves. The wages of the adulterer and murderer and liar, that is death. Someone who is called the son of David and the son of God, Jesus from Nazareth, True God and true man. He steps down from his heavenly glory. He steps into our broken wall. He steps into our place. And, and he gets what we deserve. He exchanges our sin to his righteousness. And we receive God's pardon and favor. As Paul wrote in his epistle, in his epistle to Ephesians, the love of Christ surpasses knowledge. We cannot comprehend it with our minds. Much more is needed and, and much more is given. It is given to you to experience the grace of God far more abundantly than we may hope. As Paul explains, the Holy Spirit brings Christ to dwell in your hearts so that you are rooted and grounded in His love, so that you may have the strength of God's Spirit to comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth of God's grace, so you may be filled with all the fullness of our holy God. What we cannot grasp with our minds, the triune God allows us to experience as He Himself embraces us, as He dwells in you, and as His presence from time to time may give us a glimpse, a momentary feeling of what His grace and love are like. Brothers and sisters, we are not that different from King David. Actually, we are. <laughs> we are. We trust our Lord far less than he did. We want to please our Lord far less than he did. And usually we are not at all in hurry to repent of our sins, secret or open. And still, just like our God embraced David, just like he forgave him as soon as David realized what he had done, the same grace is given to us. And it does not matter what we have done, what your secret or open sins are, whatever great they may be. As soon as the Holy Spirit helps you to realize that you have sinned against true God in thoughts, words, and actions, as soon as you want to turn away from your sins, to return to your God, we hear this welcoming and life-changing voice. I forgive you all your sins. You shall live. And this is a message of this account. Even the best among us have the same dreadful sin dwelling in them. 
and even the worst among us receive the same abundant grace. May we never forget it. May we never forget it. Amen.